Huawei may be considered China's national champion, but you'd never know by visiting their campus in Dongguan. Did I just hear we're entering Heidelberg now? Yes, we're there. That's the theme of this place. <laughs> The buildings occupy a vast three-and-a-half square mile property in southern China. The space inspired by a dozen European cities. We just passed Paris earlier. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> There's a replica of Versailles, the Liberty Bridge from Budapest, and the Old Bridge from Heidelberg. There's even a European-style train to get employees across campus. Huawei invited us in as part of a months-long charm offensive. The company at the center of the U.S.-China trade war, eager to prove it has nothing to hide, regardless of what the Trump administration says. According to the indictment in 2012, Huawei began a concerted effort to steal information about a robot that T-Mobile used to test mobile phones. Huawei is something that's very dangerous. Is Huawei a national security threat, or is this just a pawn in some trade negotiation? When Huawei first started 31 years ago, the company had just three employees. Today, it has more than 180,000 globally, with 18,000 of them right here on this campus. And the employees that work here are fiercely loyal. We think it's pretty inconceivable. From what we feel, we're just a company that works really hard, including all of our employees. We don't know why the U.S. would make such a move against us. In fact, I believe as time passes by, the U.S., including the government, will realize that such sanctions against us is not very reasonable. Yes, my family has some concerns. They're worried about the future of the company because there are many talks about Huawei in the society right now. Founder and CEO Ren Zhengfei says U.S. pressure has injected a sense of crisis here. Back in May, the Department of Commerce added Huawei to a trade blacklist, effectively banning American companies from supplying parts and components. That sent sales plummeting as much as 40 percent in some markets, bringing the company to a standstill. I don't think we were fully prepared for being added to the entity list, so we faced some pressure. However, after we tried to sort out our internal problems, we found that we are fully capable of shaking off our reliance on the U.S. for our core products and depending on ourselves to survive. But we also have many other products that cannot do without U.S. components, so we cut some of these products to reduce the pressure. Over 80,000 members of our technical staff are working hard to fix other holes in the development of our company. From what we're seeing today, we've made pretty good progress. This is going to connect over to uh, what we call a baseband unit, BDU. Okay. That antenna has the amplifiers in it. They connect by fiber optics to this guy. Uh, this is something Huawei is very proud of. Telecommunications equipment has fueled Huawei's rise, and the company is banking its future on 5G technology. It invests nearly 15 percent of its revenue in R&D each year. This exhibition hall on campus is Huawei's way of saying we are winning the global 5G race. This is a uh, 5G, what we would call a dongle. It's a mobile hotspot. There's a SIM that goes in here, and then it creates a little private Wi-Fi network for you based upon 5G. Explain to us, for those who are not very familiar, what kind of speeds we're talking about. What kind of speeds we're talking about? It's an order of magnitude better than what you get in 4G. We're being able to deliver 100 megabits uh, to homes uh, in real commercial services. Where are we right now? And we can hit peak speeds of 3 gigabits. Where are we now? Yep. Um, in the U.S., you're lucky to get 5 megabits. So we're talking... So we're talking a 20-time improvement over the kind of mobile services you get on the best days. Huawei plans to ship out more than 600,000 base stations this year, far more than competitors Nokia and Ericsson. But that rapid development Huawei prides itself on has put the U.S. on notice. 5G technology is at the center of this battle between the U.S. and China. Today, Huawei is a clear leader when it comes to 5G equipment globally, and the U.S. has pointed to that as one big reason 
why it believes the company poses a national security risk. We're talking about something that doesn't just empower your smartphone, doesn't make it faster to do downloading. It actually is the backbone for the Internet of Things. Mm -hmm. In other words, it is smart cities, it's autonomous driving, it's critical infrastructure, it's anything with a chip in it. And as a consequence, it matters a lot more to mm -hmm. the state than what happens with your individual iPhone. In the last five years, China has moved from a country that we see as ripping off IP and well behind us hmm. to a technology superpower that actually is leading the world in significant areas of key technology, in significant areas of artificial intelligence, hmm. including 5G. The debate has seeped into Huawei's R&D labs, where researchers like Peng Fei Li are tasked with strengthening the company's edge. Huawei is a very, is a very international company, right? So uh, especially for me, I study in the United States. I come here, I, I would like to use my education background, right? Uh, uh, especially semiconductor industry, there are so many cooperations uh, going on throughout the world. Lee's research tests the durability of Huawei's 5G equipment. He tells me U.S. pressure on Huawei has rattled some nerves here, especially his own. I have to have a sense that which technology is sensitive to the U.S. government before I develop a, a technology, mm. right? I mean, that really gives me, uh, gives me a boundary on my research because technology, you know, is like a a double blade knife. So, right, I mean, good people can use this knife to do good things, but bad people can use this knife to do bad things. And technology is like this. So, so definitely we are trying to develop this technology for good, but I'm not sure if, if the U.S. government um, will look at this. Uh, You're no. saying you don't want to be a target. Yeah, Basically. I don't want to be a target. Yeah, that's a, that's right. I don't want to develop some technologies that that that's are going to draw attention to yeah, you. Yeah, that right, right, right. Ren dismisses fears about Huawei's leadership in 5G, saying the risks have been overstated. But his personal past has only heightened Washington's view that the company can't be trusted. Before he founded Huawei, Ren served as an engineer for the People's Liberation Army during China's Cultural Revolution. Let me ask you about something that has been a consistent narrative. I know you've heard this over and over, which is um, your military past um, as an engineer in the PLA. And I know historically, um, you know, you've talked about how insignificant that was when you think about when this all played out. How far do you think you need to go to, to convince the administration uh, of, you know, that there is no, no tie there right now? I've never considered needing to convince the U.S. administration of my identity. I believe survival is success. In the future, I also won't attempt to clarify who I am to the U.S. government. I am a clean man. I wash myself every day. And I don't think it's necessary to ask people to check whether I am clean or not. There are also many veterans working in U.S. companies. But do we say that these companies are all backed by the U.S. military? I think the U.S. should put themselves in our shoes. China has had over 50 million veterans since the 1970s, and these veterans need to work and make a living. The employment of a veteran does not suggest a company's relationship with the military. Still, Huawei is determined to forge ahead, rapidly expanding beyond its core carrier business. Kevin Ho leads the handsets division here, a unit that's managed to surpass Apple as the number two smartphone maker in the world in just 10 years. That initial target you had a few years ago to, to beat Samsung to become the number one smartphone maker by 2020, does mm. that still hold? Uh, this, this is our challenge target, but actually, you know, it's a very challenge because nowadays Huawei, uh, we are still uh, uh, the, facing a lot of challenge besides the technology because we have the, some limitation. Some limitations as a result <laughs> of the pressure coming yeah. from the U.S. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Uh, We're using big screen. If U.S. components make up a small part of these smartphones, and, uh, but they all rely on Google's Android operating system, a partnership that's now in jeopardy. 
If the Commerce Department doesn't grant Google a waiver, Ho admits his unit may have to put its ambitions on hold. Have you considered potential delays on the launches if you are not able to operate in, in the way you have been? We are discussing this kind of issue, and now this, we have the only plan A to prepare launch our new products with Android. For Ren Zhengfei, there is no plan B. He says Huawei will come out on top in spite of U.S. pressure. And he has rallied employees to his side with this image displayed throughout campus, an old Soviet World War II plane riddled with bullet holes. Walking around campus, we saw that image of the plane. You've talked a lot about this plane being able to fly despite having holes in it. Um, why this symbolism? Why, why is that? Why have you chosen that plane to represent Huawei? I saw it on the internet shortly after the U.S. put us on the entity list. I had the feeling that it resembled us so much, seriously injured with wounds all over our bodies and with only our hearts beating. The aircraft was able to fly home. I believe we will also be able to fly home and land safe and sound. That ending still in doubt as Huawei navigates its toughest chapter yet.